What's up, Renaissance fam? My name is Jordan. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, shout out to everybody that's new. Uh, my family and I have been away for the last couple of weeks. Now, I don't have any scientific data for this, but I am convinced that once you turn 40, on your 40th birthday, your brain starts to do different things. <laughs> one of those things is your relationship to boats and dizziness will change. I used to love being dizzy. I used to love roller coasters, love all those things. Uh, but this past week, my family and I, my wife and I went on a vacation, and we were with a bunch of friends. And one of the activities for the day was to get on one of these little boats, tours around the bay, it's supposed to be nice and calm, take in the sights. Before we got on the boat, they warned us it's a little bit rocky today. It was not a little bit rocky, it was a lot of it rocky. <laughs> 3.2 minutes into the boat ride, I saw a lot of my friends, all over 40 years old, proving my scientific theory. Their faces changed from all smiles and laughter, arguing about who had the aux cord, to concern. You know that moment when you realize that something is not right? Now, a couple of their faces started to frown, and I realized that they were starting to have some motion sickness. Fun fact, the word nausea comes from the Greek word nos, which means boat. So there's a direct correlation between these two things. <laughs> now, for the past seven months of my life, I've been dealing with a lot of migraine issues, and one of those wonderful things that I've been dealing with is, is dizziness. So I have become an expert in dizziness. Uh, and when we got in the boat, when I saw their faces starting to turn pale, I tried to go to each and every person. I said, listen, you have to stop looking down. You have to stop looking and having a conversation, trying to pretend like everything is normal. You need to leave this area of the back of the boat, and you need to go to the front of the boat. Now, paradoxically, even though it is the rockiest in the front of the boat, on the front of the boat, you will have an unobstructed view of the horizon, and you can look out at the mountains. And by looking at the mountains, something that does not move, you will be able to orient yourself. Now, this is not just me giving them my uh, apparent, uh, opinion that I read on social media somewhere, but um, when you look at a horizon, what happens is you give your brain a point of reference to lock into. Now, motion sickness is caused in part by these conflicting and confusing sensory signals flooding your brain. Your eyes are telling you one thing, but your, your body and your vestibular system is telling you another thing, which leads you to this feeling of nausea. You feel like you're moving more than you actually are, and your body cannot orient itself. The solution is not to get off the boat. The solution is not to look down. The solution is not to pretend, and the solution for sure is not to close your eyes. The solution is to look at something that does not change. By fixing your eyes on something that does not change, you will orient yourself. Now, this is not just with catamarans in Mexico. This is also with your life. Your experience with your life depends not just on your situation. It depends on what you are looking at. Now, from the outset, I certainly don't want to minimize any of one of your situations. Uh, our situations certainly play a role in how we experience life. But how you experience your life depends on what you're looking at. So this summer, we're looking at a number of psalms, and we're going through the psalms, and the psalms, they are poems, songs uh, found in the scripture that have carried men and women of faith for thousands of years. These are songs that have been sung, um, and for thousands of years, people have turned to them in dark seasons. They've turned to them in high seasons. And the psalm that we're going to look at today is a psalm all about turning your attention to something that does not move. Turning your attention to God, the mountain of God and God's love. So we're going to be in Psalm 121. Uh, it says as follows. It should be on the screens to my side. I lift up my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter by your side. The sun will not strike you by day or the moon by night. 
The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and going, both now and forever. Now, this psalm is meant to turn our eyes today from your situation. This psalm is meant to turn our eyes from your circumstances to the mountain of God and God's love. Here's how it starts. It starts off with uh, David, the author, making a declaration of faith. And this declaration is one that I hope that you leave here making for yourself. Now, not every scripture is as portable as this one. And by portable, I mean you can't just take every single scripture and immediately input it into your life. But this one, you can. Here's what David says in verse 1 and 2. He says, I lift up my eyes toward the mountains. And he asks himself a rhetorical question, where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And what David is talking about here is a decision that he is making. He is making a decision to change his perspective, to change what he is looking at from the things immediately in front of him to look up toward the hills, towards the mountain. Now, why is this so important? Because what you are looking at will determine how how high you're flying. This past week, I learned a, a new term that planes have attitudes. Most of us are aware that planes have an altitude. You've been on a plane where the pilot has come over the air with his raspy voice and talked about, we are now cruising at a safe altitude of 30,000 feet. You are now clear to cruise about the cabin. But a term that you might not be familiar with is attitude. Now, attitude is not about how high you're flying. Attitude is about the, the position of the nose in relationship to the horizon. So if the plane has a nose down attitude, that means the plane will be going down. If the plane has a nose-up attitude, it will be going up. So your altitude is always determined by your attitude. In order for us to be able to truly rise out of our situations, and this is not meant to be pie in the sky, something that's meant to just fill you uh, as some fake antidote to real problems or real issues, but rather an intentional decision that you and I need to make that if we are going to soar above the madness that we will find ourselves in, we need to change our attitude. We need to change and make uh, an intentional decision to change our attitude and to change our focus and change what we're looking at. Now, practically speaking, how do you do that, right? How do you look at the mountains from whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord. Uh, Man, first and foremost, I think that you and I need to make sure that we are making conscious decisions to protect our time, to protect our time so that we can invite God into the madness that might be our lives. We're just too busy. We're too distracted. We have so many signals coming our way that we're nauseous. We're disoriented. We have no focus. Part of that is because we're not always protecting our time to make sure that we are guarding areas in our life where we can actually reorient our vision and our orientation to make sure that we are looking up with God. You know, years ago, I was, uh, my family and I were going through a really difficult time, and I'll never forget just not wanting at all to pray, read the Bible, and, you know, I got to read the Bible to preach sermons, but I was like, I I don't want to do any of this stuff. I didn't want to pray. I just didn't care. I I felt this general sense of apathy really, truly creeping in my entire body. So it wasn't motivation. I wasn't relying on internal motivation to carry me through. I don't know who it was that recommended this, but I I remember spending about 10 or 15 minutes praying through my fears, praying through my anxieties, praying through my anger, and taking all of these things to God in prayer. I set a timer for 15 minutes to bring all these things to God, thinking that nothing's going to change. My situation is going to be the same 15 minutes later than it was 15 minutes before. And the situation remained the same, but when I got out, of that room, I was different. I was flying at a different altitude. I had changed my perspective. Here's what I want to encourage you to do, first and foremost. You need to protect your time like it is valuable. You need to protect your time like it is a really valuable thing because you don't have it in abundance. There's so many scriptures that tell us, Lord, teach us to number our days. We live and we act like time is just an infinite resource at our disposal and it's not. We don't have all the time in the world to do everything. We have a very limited amount of time in every single day to accomplish tasks. And if we don't 
set aside time and protect it, and I'm preaching to myself right now, set aside time and protect it, we're never going to be able to focus on God. Here's the thing that's really important. What you really value, you'll protect. What you value, you'll protect. That necklace that your grandmother left you, you don't just have that sitting in some random spot. It's protected. A few weeks ago, my wife and I were downtown, and we just saw all of these cops everywhere. They were like swarming everywhere. And we walked past this one neighborhood, and we, we heard that, you know, Haley Bieber uh, was releasing a uh, makeup line or something. And I was like, all of these cops are not for no Biebers. I know I'm a believer. I love the Biebers and all of that, but <laughs> all of these cops and these, these metal rods, all these, this ain't for no Biebers. And then later we realized uh, when we saw the presidential motorcade go through, uh, what exactly was being protected. And, you know, 15 minutes later, they had, a, you know, hundreds and hundreds of cops all protecting the presidential motorcade. And what we realized was that because there was someone of a lot of importance, they protected it. They protected him. In your life, you will protect the things that you find to be valuable. You'll protect them. And I think we have this disoriented relationship with our time as if it's not valuable as if you can get the days back, as if you can get yesterday back. I'm all for chilling. I love my new couch. I got a new couch. It's my favorite spot in the world. But we need to be intentional about our time and not just act like it's this resource that we can have at our disposal all the time. And so, practically speaking, we need to make sure that we are stopping, we are pausing to allow God's truth in Scripture, whether it's through Scripture meditation and prayer, reciting the Lord's Prayer. Listen, if you don't know a whole lot about God or the, or the Bible, if you just go to the Lord's Prayer and pray it slowly, pray it slowly and let it wash over you, it will change your perspective. But instead of, you know, stopping to do that, here's what I do. I, I have two areas that I love to turn my attention to instead of God's Word and, and Scripture and prayer sometimes. Uh, the first is just on uh, other people. I made the worst decision of my life financially, all because of a dude named Chill Will. <laughs> Every black person in their 40s has at least one friend named Chill Will. And uh, my boy Chill Will, this was in 2008, uh, he had just bought this apartment, and this joint was fly. And I had just gotten out of law school, and I was feeling pretty great about my life. I walked into his apartment, and 10 minutes into his apartment, I felt like a failure. Chill Will had sunken living, uh, sunken living room floors, black leather couches. This was my goal back in the day, y'all. I've evolved since then, but <laughs> he had all the black leather furniture, the, end, the glass end table. I was like, yo, Chill Will is killing it. I need to get like Chill Will. That day, as soon as the door closed behind me, I determined to buy an apartment just like Chill Will. Six months later, the financial market collapsed. The real estate market went into hay market and turmoil. And that investment that I put my life savings and some of my parents' money into, <laughs> still all my parents' money from that, don't, look, don't go looking for that money, mom and dad. It went away. Now, I got caught in something called the comparison trap. And here's the deal about the comparison trap. There is no win in comparison. On the road of comparison, there's only two exits, pride and discouragement. If you are doing better than your friends, if you're staring at them, you're going to feel amazing. You're going to feel prideful that you're doing better than the people in front of you. What type of life is it that is a life that's filled with pride that you're doing better than other people? Is that the life that God wants you to have? The other exit is an exit I take so many times, and it's discouragement. It's that, God, you have not given me the life that you have given this person, and as a result, uh, my life is not good. And even worse, you're not good because you haven't given me what you've given them. Now, when our eyes, when our attention is fixed on other people, when we are caught in the comparison trap, our lives, our experience of the moment will change. Now, here's a really important thing. Literally 30 seconds before I walked into Chill Will's apartment, I felt great. I felt fantastic. Five minutes after leaving his apartment, I felt like a failure. Nothing had changed in my life. The only thing that had changed was what I was looking at and what I was comparing myself to.
another thing that is a very powerful uh, thing to look at, to focus on, something that locks me in so often is just my present day circumstances. I like to call this circumstantial faith. Circumstantial faith is when our life and our faith is leaning on a circumstance, period. And so if the circumstance changes, if the circumstance falls, we're going to fall. If the circumstance holds up, we'll hold up. The goodness of God should never determine itself on a circumstance. As a pastor, here's what I've seen a thousand times in the last decade. So many people come to our meeting and they say, Pastor, I'm losing faith. And I say, I know at the end of this conversation, it's going to be some version of this. I've always believed that God would never let ABC happen. Now, God has let ABC happen. Therefore, God is not good. Now, obviously, in the moment, people are hurting. I, I never push too hard on this. Um, first and foremost, I mean, if you read the, through the Bible, through the stories of Scripture, God does not promise us an ease-filled existence through this planet. As a matter of fact, if you look at the pages of Scripture, you'll see oftentimes that those that follow God the closest almost often experience the most pain and heartache and trials and tribulations. But there's so many of us who have tied our faith and tied our attention to the circumstances, circumstances, and we're nauseous, we're dizzy, we're disoriented because our circumstances are always moving. And when the circumstances move, we move. What the psalm is inviting us to do is to take our eyes off of our circumstance and to put them on the one that does not move, to fix our attention on the mountain of God's love that does not change. God's character that does not move, does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, I was talking to my wife this past week. I mentioned earlier that I've been dealing with dizziness the past couple of months. And, uh, you know, I've been, this past week, dealing with a whole lot of discouragement uh, and dealing with dizziness. And I've been going back and forth to uh, neurologists and all this different stuff. And I'm not looking for any advice. Don't tell me about the blueberry shake that your cousin had. That... <laughs> that healed them miraculously. I've tried it. I've tried all the blueberry shakes. <laughs> but what I was realizing about myself was this. I was fixing my attention on my situation. And on the days that I was doing good, I felt great. Not just physically, but I felt great spiritually. I felt full of vitality. God is with me on my side because I'm not really feeling dizziness today. And the days where I was feeling dizziness, more and more I was just feeling discouraged and hopeless. Why was that? It's because I was leaning, not just my day, but I was leaning my faith on a situation. And situations change minute by minute. And if you lean your life on a situation, you're setting yourself up for drastic failure because the situations are going to come crashing down eventually. Instead, this psalm is inviting us to take moments out of our day and to look up and to be intentional to invite our life into God's story of what God is doing in our lives and to back up a little bit from our current circumstances and to be a little bit more curious about what God is doing and to give God some space to let God cook. My wife is telling me about one of her friends. They always give free stuff whenever they go to a restaurant. And whenever they go to a restaurant, her friend starts talking to the waiters and like three minutes later, the waiters are bringing appetizers and free stuff all over there. And they're like, yo, listen, just let her cook. Don't, don't interfere in what she's doing. Let her cook. A lot of us in our life, we need to back up and let God cook in our lives. Give God the space to actually work in our lives. You know, one of our friends, John O., he's a wonderful preacher in Atlanta. He's blessed Renaissance a number of times. He says this, and it's one of my favorite quotes. He says, when it comes to making sense of God's work in your life, you make a better historian than you do detective. Historians reflect on the past to help make sense of present circumstances. Detectives solve mysteries. God works in mysterious ways, and you ain't Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> the psalmist continues in verses 3 through 8, and he says, He will not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The sun will not strike you by day or the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all harm. 
He will protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and going both now and forget forever. Now, if you are a thinking person, particularly when you read verse 7 that says the Lord will protect you from all harm and he'll protect your life, many of you have encountered a lot of harm. And you're saying, Lord, make it make sense. I don't don't understand how this scripture could be true if it sounds like God is over-promising and he's under-delivering, that if I were to really stand on this, I would end up being disappointed. And here's uh, some encouragement I want to uh, to give you on this. Number one, this is a genre of scripture called poetry. And poetry is true, but it's not literal. You know, Another thing that happens when you turn 40 is you realize that there is never going to be again good music that comes out. (laughs) I don't know what the year is exactly, 2009, 10, but it stopped. It's 2008, all right, 2008, 08 was it. That was the year when all, all new music after that is now definitively trash. And listen... My wife and I were watching a tiny desk the other night of Babyface. Right. He got hits. He got hits. Let's go hit for hit. Let, talk to me in the fellowship hall. We'll argue about this. And uh, one of my favorite Babyface songs is Two Occasions. It says, I, I only think about you on two occasions. That's it. Day and night. <laughs> right. They go for broke. Listen, now that is true. He is, when, when I sing that song poorly and I think about my wife, I say, yes, I, that is true. But it's not literal, right? I think about my wife day and night. Do I go to sleep? Yes. Do I work? Yes. Am I watching the Olympics? Of course. Uh, Poetry has a way of getting inside of our hearts with truth, but it's not necessarily literal. This poem about God's goodness, it's true, but it's not literal. And why is it not literal? It's because we live in the already, but the not yet. Where there is, we already experience glimpses of God's goodness. We experience glimpses of God's salvation, but we have not yet experienced the fullness of God's goodness and God's salvation. One day, we will all experience the fullness of God's salvation for everybody who has placed their faith in Christ, and there will be no harm that comes to you. You know, uh, one of the scriptures that is probably the most enduring, endearing scriptures to me in the Bible, Jesus in John 6 is talking to a group of people, and he says, Father, those that you have given me, they are all in my hand, and I have not lost one. The good news of Christianity is not that Jesus is in your heart. The good news of Christianity is that you are in his hand. God has you. Your protector does not fall asleep. He does not slumber. He has you in his hand. Yes, things are rocky. Yes, things are crazy. And I don't know what the outcome is going to be of the situation, but I do know this. Do not fix your eyes on the outcome. Fix it on him in the mountain of his love. You know, another thing I was doing as I was researching all of this, this, uh, this psalm, these are called songs of ascent, meaning this psalm, this psalm was written as there were pilgrims who were moving from one location to another. So they were singing about God's faithfulness even though they were homeless. They were singing about God's protection even though they were facing danger. Why would they do that? Because they knew that songs could carry them when situations couldn't. If you were to go back in history, in American history, and look at my ancestors who were picking cotton in cotton fields, they were writing songs and hymns and Negro spirituals that many of the writers of these spirituals would sing about God's faithfulness. They would sing about the freedom that was coming, but they would sing about a freedom that was coming to me that they would themselves never experience. And why did they write these songs? because they knew that songs could carry them when the situation couldn't. This psalm will carry you when your situation can't. Here's what will happen if you really look up towards God. 
If you slow down and you look up at the mountain of God from where your help is coming from, you know, this scripture lets us in on a little bit of the beauty of the gospel, but it does it paradoxically. It does it by showing us the the opposite. Verses six and seven, it says, the sun will not strike you by day or the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all harm and he will protect your life. Uh, When I read these scriptures, I think about the one who was struck, the one Jesus, the one who was God who came in the flesh for me and he was struck. You know, if you were to read through the New Testament in its entirety, or if you were to read through the book of John in its entirety, what you'll notice is that the last seven days of Jesus's life, there's about a quarter of the book of John to a third of the book of John slowed down just on the last week of his life. Why is that? Because John knew that there were details about the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus that you and I would need to slow down and to look at, that we would need to fix our eyes on. And that as Jesus was being charged in the sham trial, he was being struck all over his body. As Jesus was carrying the cross up the hill, he was being struck across the face and mocked and spit on. Why was Jesus doing that? Why would Jesus endure such treatment. If you were to look up at the mountain, you'll see three crosses, two with criminals on the side and one with Jesus in the middle. That cross in the middle is the mountain of God's love pointed down at you for you to look up at. And if you ever encounter a circumstance and a scenario in your life where you doubt whether or not God is for you, look up at the mountain where the one who knew no sin became sin for you. So that you and I might become the righteousness of God. You know, what kind of love would it need to be for someone to endure the cross for you? What kind of peculiar, otherworldly love would it need to be to stay up on that mountain Here's what God wants you to do. He wants you to certainly live in reality with your situation, but he wants your attention to be on the mountain, the mountain of his love for you. And when you look at that mountain, you will have to endure difficulty for sure, but you will endure that difficulty a different way because you will endure it knowing that the one who gave you his all in Jesus If God did not spare his son Jesus, will he not graciously, along with him, also give you all things? Yes, he will. And so my invitation to you this week is that we would invite God into our lives, into our stories, and we would be curious to know and to wonder and to ponder what God might be up to in our lives. And that when we encounter the variety of bumps and bruises and shakes and twists and turns that life throws at us, we would lift our eyes up and look out at him. And by looking out at him, it would change, we ex- change the way we experience our life. You know, God wants to, first and foremost, make your life about more than just your little story. Your life is bigger than your last week, your last month, your last year. God wants to invite you into his big, grand story. There's a story about three bricklayers, and there's a man walking through this construction zone. And curious as to what they were building, the man goes to the first bricklayer and says, Sir, what are you doing? The first man says, I'm laying bricks. Then the man approached the second bricklayer and said the same question. Sir, what are you doing? The second man said, I'm building a wall. Then he journeyed to the third man and said, what are you doing? And the third man looked up with a smile on his face and said, I'm building a cathedral. All three bricklayers were doing the same thing, and yet their perspectives were drastically different. The first saw his life as a mere task, meaningless, monotonous, worthless. The second saw his life as a part of a larger project, but still not inspiring. And the third saw his life as contributing to something magnificent and greater than himself. Now, your perspective in the present will change the way that you experience your situation. God is inviting us to remember, to reflect, 
Your life is a part of his grand story that he's telling. We live in the already, but the not yet. And he encourages us to walk and live by faith until we do. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, you are good. Lord, there's so many people who have come in nauseous from the turns and twists and rockiness of their lives. And Lord, I pray that they would be encouraged and able to look out and to see a mountain that doesn't move. And Lord, I pray that they stare at it. I pray that I stare at it. I pray that in the confusing times, I look at the mountain. I pray that in the good times, I look at the mountain. And every time in between, Lord. Lord, in your grace, may we be reminded that you do not treat us with judgment when we come back to your table. You treat us with invitation. So Lord, we accept your invitation to come back to you, to look up once again. And Lord, here, may we find your goodness, your power, your love, your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.